Well, hi, my name is Trish. Uh, I'm a doctor and a social scientist, and I want to talk to you tonight about why technology projects in healthcare so often fail and what we can do to help them succeed. And I'm going to start with a story about memory loss. A few years ago, I was contacted by someone from Newham Council. Newham's a borough in the east end of London, you know, where they held the Olympics. And, and the problem Newham had was that people with memory loss would sometimes go out of their homes, maybe to walk the dog or go to the pub, and then they wouldn't be able to find their way back. So the council wanted to go into partnership with a tech company that made a little gadget. It looked a bit like this, this wristwatch, uh, but it wasn't a watch because instead of the clock face, it had a, a GPS tracker in it um, so that when the person didn't come home when expected or when they strayed beyond a geographical boundary that you could sort of program into this gadget, which was called a geofence, if they breached their geofence, uh, an alert would be triggered, and then someone could go and fetch them and bring them back home safely. Now, I was quite keen on this because a few years prior to that, my own father, who had memory loss, had wandered down the stairs in the middle of the night, opened the front door, and just wandered off into the, into the darkness. And my husband and I had spent several hours very anxiously waiting for the local police to search the gardens and the parks and the alleyways nearby. And, and, and eventually, they brought my dad back with a big bump on his forehead and bits of leaves and grass in his hair. Um, so I was up for something called action research, which is where academics join forces with people in the real world and try and do something useful. So my team and I joined up uh, for this 18-month action research project. So let me tell you what happened. Uh, at the beginning of the project, we estimated that there were around 1,500 people in Newham with some kind of memory loss. By the end of the 18 months, 11 of them had been supplied with one of these GPS tracking gadgets, of which seven had agreed to be part of our research, and three were still using it by the end of the 18 months. It's not great success, is it? Now, what went wrong? Well, I think fundamentally what went wrong was that in our heads, we had taken a very complex problem. We turned it into a much simpler problem, and then we picked a single technology to solve that oversimplified problem. So let's talk about complexity. The health and social care systems are made up of multiple interacting components, which are evolving dynamically and are interdependent. And what that means is that health and social care cannot be fully predicted or controlled. So let me take you through a few of the interacting complexities in the Newham GPS tracker project. First of all, there's memory loss itself. It's not a single condition. It's a manifestation of many different underlying illnesses. And of course, it coexists with other illnesses, what we call comorbidities, and it progresses over time very often. Then there's the technology this natty little tracking device that you just have to put on your wrist, it's only going to work as a, as a safety net in memory loss because it's connected to a highly complex technical and human infrastructure. Then there's something called the value proposition. If you talk to anyone who's in business, he or she will say, if you're making a product, it's got to generate value both financial and non-financial, for all the stakeholders. Take the patient, for example. Has anyone ever demonstrated that someone with memory loss who wears one of these GPS tracking devices is going to be safer than someone who doesn't wear one? I mean, maybe it's like, I'm playing devil's advocate here, you know, they say about bicycle helmets, if you wear one, you take more risks. Maybe we don't know. Then there's the individuals who you're hoping will adopt this technology. Now, putting aside the patient, there's also the staff. Now, in Newham, we talked to a lot of staff, uh, and most of them were very keen on the device. In fact, it was their idea. But there were some people, particularly some social workers, who thought this was a really bad idea. They described it as a granny tag, and they used the term granny tagging to convey that they were concerned about state surveillance. Now, you may not agree with that interpretation. You may say, no, no. This is a liberating device. It's empowering people to be able to go for a walk in their own neighborhood. 
But the problem is, if the frontline staff, whose job it is to persuade the patients to use this, actually believe it's professionally inappropriate and even unethical, then they're not going to be falling over themselves to bring people into the program. Then there's organizational complexity. I don't have to tell you people that health and social care organizations are highly complex. Now, you will have heard the term disruptive technology as if it's a good thing for a technology to imply that we're now going to do everything completely different. People are going to do their jobs differently. They're going to interact with different people. We could even introduce new service models on the back of this technology. It's a problem with that. The research literature is very clear. The more the technology requires things to be done differently in an organization, the less likely it is to be taken up and mainstreamed and sustained as business as usual. Finally, there's regulatory complexity. I mean, is this GPS tracker a medical device? If it is, it's going to have to be approved by the Medicines and Healthcare Devices Regulatory Agency. And even if it's not a medical device, which I'm pretty sure it's not, there'll be other regulatory bodies that have got to check it and approve it and make sure it does what it says it does and it's safe and reliable and all that kind of thing. If you were a GP or a social worker who advised someone to use one of these devices and then they came to harm, would your professional indemnity association cover you for the result of litigation? Okay, so I hope I've persuaded you that this simple problem with its simple technological solution is actually full of complexities. And that is almost always the case when people try and introduce technologies into the health or care systems. Now, our good Secretary of State for Health, Matt Hancock, has just been on a trip around the world, particularly to China, looking for disruptive technologies. He's brought them back, and he might be knocking on your door soon to say, I've got just the technology for you. Please, will you implement it? Because it's going to make healthcare better, safer, more affordable, all that kind of thing. How are you going to help Matt deliver the promise of these new technologies? I've got three pieces of advice for you. Number one... Before you grab that technology, try to understand the problem in all its interacting complexity. And to do that, the best way of doing that is to tell a story like I did with the Newham case. And into that story, you need to put the illness, the technology, the value proposition, um, the individuals you want to adopt the technology, the organizational tasks and processes, the regulatory and wider environment, and how all these things link together and are going to unfold over time. Second thing you need to do, try to reduce the complexity in as many aspects of the system as you possibly can. Can you, for example, sharpen what we call the use case for the technology? Can you define a group of patients for which this technology is going to be particularly effective? Can you take this technology and do what we call de-risking it? In other words, removing some of the inessential bells and whistles. In particular, can you step back from trying to make it interoperable with every different technical system in the hospital or wherever? Can you ensure that the technology, as far as possible, is being used within existing tasks and processes and job descriptions and so on? The third thing you need to do is follow the logic of complex systems. Remember I said that complex systems are not fully predictable or controllable. And what that means is it's a really bad idea to try and over-specify your project with really tight goals and milestones. And it's an even worse idea to try and micromanage the staff who are doing the implementing. Frontline staff are actually pretty good at getting the show on the road and keeping it there using what we call workarounds, adaptive approaches. But in order to do that, they need training, they need resources, and above all, they need permission to take an adaptive and flexible approach to project management rather than a prescriptive and rigid one. That's all I've got time for. I'm just going to, you know, Matt, if you are listening or anyone else who wants to transform our health and care services with the aid of technology, here's my final message. If what you're seeing is a simple problem and a simple te technical solution, you probably need to do a bit more work uh, to get your head around all the complexities. So I'd like to thank my great research team and also the Wellcome Trust 
and the National Institute for Health Research for funding the work I've been telling you about today. <laughs>